Welcome to MEC at Home. If you're a regular viewer, welcome. If you're viewing for the first time today, a special welcome to you. My name's Roger, one of the pastors at MEC. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, we read this. The Lord is near. Isn't that lovely? We may be socially distant from each other, but the Lord is near to all of us. And he's near to us to help us. Have a listen to this next verse. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, I'm noticing that some of us right now have never been busier. Others of us have time on our hands. But whatever the situation, the Lord is near to help. And he invites us to bring our requests to him. And listen to this beautiful promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are near to us, even though we are separate from one another right now. We thank you that you are near to help us. Lord, we do bring our requests to you. We pray for your grace, for your strength, for your help each day. And we pray, Lord, that you will reassure us of your everlasting, deep peace with us today and forevermore. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's some exciting news at uh, MEC at Home. We're hoping that in two weeks' time, this video will be, you'll be able to view it on a MEC at Home webpage. And uh, it'll be one of many resources there to help you do church at home better. But for now, let's join together in praising God. So we sing hallelujah. 
Hi Church, uh, my name is Kathy, but if you haven't met me, I'm married to Jared and we have a little girl Hallie who is one and we belong to 830 congregation. Uh, we're going to pray now. Uh, so I have the great privilege of uh, leading us in prayer uh, to a God who delights to hear us speak to him. Uh, to begin our time in prayer, we're going to pray the words of the psalmist in Psalm 90. So please pray with me. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yet we still fail to love you with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offences, we pray, and make us clean that we may continue as members of Christ in whom alone is salvation. Lord God, thank you for our church and for the city of Maitland. We thank you for the common grace that you pour out onto the residents of Maitland, for sustaining and providing for our community during this time of upheaval and uncertainty. We ask that you will use MEC to reach out to our city, even in these isolated days. Please provide opportunities for our church to be salt and light to our neighbours. Help us to be confident in your gospel. Holy Spirit, make us bold and compassionate in word and deed. Lord, thank you for our pastors and their families, for the way that they faithfully and tirelessly serve our congregation for your glory. We ask that you continue to sustain them, give them wisdom as they seek to lead our congregation well, encourage them as they go about their week, help them to love their families well, cause them to always seek you. We particularly pray for our brother Kevin, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would give him rest, health, and well-being. Let him return to us soon, we pray. Father, thank you for our nation's health care system. Thank you for those who work in health and aged care. We are so grateful to have access to excellent free health care during this time. We think particularly of those among our congregation who serve our community in these fields. We ask, Father, that you would keep them safe during this time. Please give them the energy and wisdom as they work tirelessly during this COVID-19 pandemic. Lord God, we thank and praise you that we live in a nation with good diplomatic governing bodies. Lord, we pray for our leaders, our Prime Minister and State Premier and our local mayor. Please give them wisdom and energy, Father. Help them to be diligent in the care of our country. Draw them to yourself, we pray. Holy God, we praise you and thank you for the successful launch of MEC Home Church. Father, we are overwhelmed and grateful for your provision during this time. We praise you for the more than 950 views of our church video. We pray that all who view these videos will grow in their knowledge and love for you. We pray for those working on MEC Home Church. Please give them wisdom so that they might provide great resources for our church during this time and please give them the energy and time needed to create these resources. Help them work and communicate well despite these challenges of this season. Lord, we ask that this period of isolation will see rich fruit grow in your church. Reveal yourself to us in a deep and fuller way, Lord Jesus. Let us look to you, depending on you, as the steadfast anchor for our soul. Let us hold tightly to the things of your kingdom that are unchanging. Let us turn to you when we feel the sting of isolation and the overwhelming demands of this time. Holy Spirit, give us patience and gentleness with one another. Give us an abundance of discernment so that we can understand the unique challenges and opportunities that are upon us now. And help us, Father, to stay connected however we can to our church family. Father, we pray too for those among us who are vulnerable during this season of sickness. We ask that you may provide healing, health, respite, energy, and comfort. Lord God, encourage our hearts, remind us of who you are, cause us to rely on you, remembering that our rest is found in you. Help us all to seek the things of your kingdom that will never perish. Lord, we pray now for our persecuted brothers and sisters overseas. Father, you are sovereign and almighty over your creation. You see and know all that occurs. You are a steadfast refuge for your people. Father, we ask that you continue to care for your people who are in dangerous and vulnerable circumstances. Father, we ask for courage for your followers who have left the Muslim faith, that they would withstand the pressure to return to their former way of life. 
We ask too that you would reach the hearts of those who oppose your gospel, often using violence and oppression to cry and crush your church. Bring them to a saving knowledge of your son, we pray. Please protect and unify your church globally. Provide opportunities for your people to fellowship with one another and be encouraged. Give your people boldness to share the gospel so that your church may continue to grow. Father, we commit these prayers to you. Be with us now as we hear your word preached. Help us to engage well. Soften our hearts to your word. Use, us, use your Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin. Give us wisdom and discernment as we hear your word taught. Strengthen our faith and help us to be obedient to your commands. Glory to the Father who created us. Glory to the Son who redeemed us. Glory to the Holy Spirit who sanctified us. Glory to the Most High and Undivided Trinity, whose works are inseparable, whose kingdom without end abides, from age to age forever. Amen. Hello, uh, today we're reading uh, Acts, uh, all of chapter 24, and the first seven verses of chapter 25. Uh, let's read. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots amongst the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defence. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove uh, to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring their charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found me in when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial uh, before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned proceedings. When Lysias, uh, the commander, comes, he said, I'll decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. 
When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. Uh, but uh, because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favour to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered Paul to be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him but they could not prove them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is when you're watching this. It's good to see you. It's good to be with you, even though I'm not physically with you. It's good to be able to open God's word together, even though we're not together. But we do believe it's still God's word and God is still speaking through his word. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for us to open that and see what he's preparing for us today. I'm going to see, I want to tell you two stories today. They're both true stories about real people who lived a long, long time ago. The first story comes directly from this passage. We just read it and it's about Paul. The second story is about one of the other characters from this passage. And it's what happens to them after what we just read. But I'm going to hold off on that story until the end of the sermon. But so that I can keep you on the edge of your seat. After all, I know that the rest of YouTube is just a click away and I would hate for you to get distracted and miss what God is wanting to say to you right now. Because friends, God does speak through his word, the Bible. And even though church is looking very different right now, God is still speaking. So let's pray that he does that now. Lord, we pray that you are with us today. We pray that as you speak through your word as you speak through me you reveal to us something more of yourself something more of what it is that you're calling us to and something more of the love that you've poured out for us in jesus christ it's in his name that we pray amen the first story is about a man named paul paul in this passage has been taken into protective custody by the romans because there are certain people who are wanting to kill him in the last chapter he caught wind of an assassination attempt on him, so he flees Jerusalem with a few hundred Roman soldiers into a place called Caesarea. And there he is put under trial. So we see Ananias and some of the other Jewish leaders, and they've hired a lawyer named Tertullus, who spends a lot of time buttering up the governor before finally laying out the charges against Paul. In essence, those charges come down to three things. The first one is that Paul is a troublemaker who's starting up riots. Now, that word they use for troublemaker is actually like a pest, a pestilence. Paul is like a plague in Jerusalem. He keeps stirring up riots. The second charge that they lay against him, he's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, which is another way of describing Christianity. And the third thing is that he tried to desecrate the temple. Look at the language they're using. They're coming up with this forceful argument that this is a pest. This is a nuisance who must be stopped and governor. You need to do something about this. Now, the trouble with their argument is they have absolutely no evidence for any of these crimes that Paul has supposedly committed. And Paul doesn't need to hire a fancy lawyer to back this up. He just defends himself. Look at what he says in verse 13. He says this, They cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. In essence, Paul's argument come, boils down to this. In a court of law, you need to be able to prove that the accused person is guilty. These guys cannot do that. They have absolutely no evidence that Paul was trying to start a riot or trying to desecrate the temple. The only thing that they can prove, Paul says in verse 14, is the thing that he admits to. He says this, However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which is another word for Christianity at this stage, which they call a sect. Aha! Gotcha, Paul. He just openly admitted to one of the charges that was laid against him. The only problem is, following a religion isn't actually a crime. 
So the only charge they can get him on is the only one that's not even illegal. All up, this is a sham lawsuit and it should be thrown out immediately. And so we get to verse 22 where we read the governor's, Felix's response. It says this, Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias the commander comes, he says, I will decide your case. You see, everyone in these proceedings knows that Paul is innocent. But Felix isn't quite willing to admit that just yet. He doesn't want to make an enemy of these high-ranking officials who are bringing the case against Paul, and so he comes up with an excuse to defer it. And in the meantime, what does he do? Well, read verse 23. It says this, He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. See, Paul is in lockdown now. Until the case can be resolved, he's under house arrest. He's not in trouble. He hasn't actually broken any laws. He can still communicate with his friends. He can still write letters to the churches under his care and continue his work there. It's just he has to do it from his house. Does that sound eerily familiar to anyone right now? You see, Paul doesn't know how long he's going to be in lockdown for. He doesn't know how long he's going to have to wait for a judgment on this case. He's in limbo until the case can get decided. And in the end, we read, he ends up being in that lockdown for two years. But even while under this lockdown, Felix, the governor, comes with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish princess. And Felix wants to hear more from Paul. So Paul tells him about the Christian message. And Luke, the author of Acts, summarizes Paul's message in three areas. Read verse 25 with me. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Two years of discussions with the governor. Just imagine that. Imagine that we're under lockdown right now, but every few days Loretta Baker comes and knocks on your door, or Gladys Berejiklian wants to come and have a chat with you about Christianity. What an opportunity. That's the chance that Paul has with the governor of the nation. And if you had that opportunity, what would you talk with them about? Well, Luke tells us that Paul refers to three things. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And so let's address each of these areas briefly before I conclude with that second story that I promised you at the start of the message. The first area he talks about with Felix is righteousness. Now, righteousness basically means being right, but not right as in correct, but right as in good. Righteousness means to be seen as good. Now, this is a hard-hitting start to Paul's threefold gospel message. Kids, if any of you are watching, I want, you to ask, I want to ask you a question. Can you put your hand up if you're ever good all the time? Now, obviously, I can't see if your hands are up or not, but your parents certainly can if they're in the room with you. And I can tell you this, if you did put your hand up to say, yes, I'm good all the time, then that's proof that you're not because you just told a lie. And your parents probably know that better than anyone else. But you know that as well. Can anyone be good all the time? No, we can't. We're all sinful. To be truly righteous would mean that you're good all the time, and none of us can do that. Here's the thing about righteousness. None of us can be truly righteous. We may have aspects of our lives that approach righteousness, but the good news of Jesus Christ actually starts with the bad news of our own failure. The good news of Jesus Christ starts with the bad news of our own sinfulness. We aren't righteous. Only one man in the entire world has ever been truly righteous, and that is the man Jesus Christ. And so Paul's message is already starting to show Felix, the governor, that he cannot do this on his own. And what sort of a man was Felix? Was he a righteous man? Well, the history books will tell you all about how he put dissidents to death. He managed to escape any punishment for it, though, because he had wealthy friends in very high places. But we don't even need to go into those history books or outside the passage to see what sort of a man Felix was. Why was he meeting with Paul so regularly in the first place? Well, it appears it's because he wants to be listening to Paul's message, but Luke tells us his real motivation in verse 26. Because he wanted 
a bribe. He keeps meeting with Paul. And Paul keeps telling him about Christianity. Does that sound like a righteous man? A governor who's interested in bribes? If that's the sort of man Felix was, then it's no wonder he's afraid of Paul's message. Which brings us to Paul's second point. Firstly, he spoke about righteousness, and secondly, he speaks about self-control. Now, self-control means having the discipline to put your own desires aside. Self-control means to deny yourself what you really want to do and instead do the thing that is right. Now, this is not an easy aspect of life, but it's something that all of us are going to be needing to learn over the next little while. As there are many things that we were used to be able to do, but we're not allowed to do now. Or even if we are allowed to do them, maybe we shouldn't be doing them. Last week, we saw that Paul didn't always have perfect self-control, especially when he was being falsely accused and beaten up for it. But it seems that he's learned from those mistakes by now. Look at how calm he remains through this entire chapter, even while he's falsely accused and having his character slandered. I want you to consider what might self-control look like for you in this season. Now, perhaps more than ever, we need to be self-controlled. Because a lot of the control measures that we usually rely on are out the window. And this will look different for all of us. For some of us in this season, we have a lot more freedom now. We've got a lot more time that we never used to have. And so all of a sudden, we've got to fill that time with new things. But with that extra time that we've been given, self-control looks like denying our own leisure time and instead focusing on those around us. Self-control might mean having the discipline to get out of bed on time or keep up to date with the things that we could just let fall by the wayside and probably get away with. For others of us in this weird new season that we live in, self-control looks like the opposite. Actually, we're busier now than we ever have been before. And we're around people more than we ever have been before. And so that self-control means denying yourself the time that you used to have and instead focus that time on the people around us. Self-control means suppressing those desires to get angry or annoyed at the people around us and instead to put them first. Self-control means maintaining a healthy relationship with your family, even if you're around them all the time. As Christians in this season, regardless of what new things it looks like, are we going to be known as people who are self-controlled? Well, in comparison, what sort of self-control does Felix have? Well, the fact that he's there with his wife, Drusilla, kind of answers that one for us. Historically, we know that Drusilla was a Jewish princess. She was the granddaughter of Herod the Great, and she was married off at a very young age, around 14, in fact. But she was so beautiful that she caught Felix's eye. So Felix managed to convince her to divorce her husband and marry him instead, even though he was 30 to 40 years her senior, and he was also already married. Is that what self-control looks like? Certainly not. Yet Paul brings up both these things as key aspects of the Christian message, righteousness and self-control. And unfortunately, Luke doesn't tell us why he summarized the message of these two things, but they certainly hit hard with where Felix was at. In fact, there's a lot that Luke doesn't tell us about these meetings with the governor. But what Luke does tell us is the response that this message had. It caused Felix to become afraid. And so he told Paul to stop talking, to go away. Why? Because of the third aspect of Paul's message. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. This was the second time in the passage that the judgment was messaged and was mentioned. In verse 15, Paul talks about the hope of the resurrection, but he phrases it in a different, unique way. He says this, There will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. You see, everyone wants to believe there's a resurrection to eternal life in heaven. But Paul makes the point that that's not the only end result of this judgment. The resurrection is for both the righteous and the wicked. And Paul isn't afraid of this judgment. In fact, in this entire scenario, Paul can't wait for a judgment. He's spending two years in limbo just waiting for somebody to make a judgment. Why is he looking forward to this judgment? Because he knows that he is innocent. 
He knows that when the judgment does finally come, he will be declared faultless in this scenario. And so instead of staying with this biased judge who can't make a decision, he appeals to Caesar himself. And the section finishes with this decision. You have appealed to Caesar and to Caesar you will go. Why was Paul so keen to get to the highest judgment, to the supreme court of the Roman world? Two reasons. Because he knew he was innocent. And secondly, he knew Caesar would be a fair judge. Unlike the biased and procrastinating judges he has to deal with here. You see, friends, Paul treated his belief in the judgment to come in the same way. Why could Paul look forward to God's judgment? Because he knew he would be declared innocent and he knew that God was a fair and righteous judge. What does this innocence look like for Paul? Well, we already learned that it doesn't look like perfection, but it does involve standing before God, the good and righteous judge. But Felix can't approach this final judgment in the same way. Instead, when he hears Paul talking about righteousness and about self-control and the judgment to come, he becomes afraid and he sends Paul off and defers making a decision about Paul. Felix was a procrastinator. He didn't want to deal with the issues that were in front of him, so he just put them off until a later date. But just like Felix put off the decision about Paul's result, Felix also puts off the decision that he has to make about his standing before God himself. Felix was afraid, and rightfully so, of the, of the judgment before God. But instead of letting that fear lead him towards God in repentance, he instead decided to quash that down and just lead, live on his everyday life, ignoring the judgment entirely. With all that in mind, let me tell you the second story that I promised you at the start of this message. This story takes place about 20 years after the passage we've read today, and it's about Felix's wife, Drusilla. See, Felix and Drusilla eventually had a son named Agrippa. And while Felix was working, Drusilla and Agrippa were living in another city going about their everyday lives. When all of a sudden, they felt the ground shake. They heard an almighty explosion, a hundred thousand times the power of a nuclear bomb. The sky turned black. People were screaming and running around, but it was all for naught. There was nothing they could do because the year was 79 AD. The city that Drusilla was in was named Pompeii. On that fateful day, a volcano named Mount Vesuvius erupted and blanketed the surrounding cities in lava and ash. Both Drusilla and her son perished in the eruption along with thousands of other people. For Drusilla, the day of judgment had come. Unlike Paul, who was prepared every single day for this judgment that he was awaiting, Drusilla was completely unaware. She went about her life perhaps unthinking about the gospel message that Paul had preached to her 20 years previously, or perhaps like Felix, she too had heard it and become afraid. But instead of responding to that fear and letting it drive her towards God, she squashed it down. And didn't consider that maybe, just maybe, that there was a God who she would one day stand before in judgment. But by that stage, it was too late. The day of judgment was instantaneous. It was inescapable and it was completely unpredictable. And just like we have things in common with Paul right now, where it feels like we're in a bit of limbo and we don't know how long that's going to go for, we also have things in common with Drusilla because we don't know when the day of judgment is coming. But when it does, it will be instantaneous. It will be inescapable and it will be unpredictable. But that doesn't mean we can't be prepared for it. The message that God gives us through his word is that we can be prepared for the judgment day. Like Paul, we can know for certain that when we stand before that judge, we will be deemed righteous. Why? Not because of what we've done. Because if that was the case, we would all be in the same boat. None of us would be found worthy. Instead, as Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ lived the perfect, righteous life. And so when we stand before God as judge, he doesn't look at our record of guilt. Instead, he looks at Jesus' record of innocence. And he says to us, you are deemed righteous. 
Jesus' record is perfect. It's flawless. And that can be your record too if you declare that Jesus is your king. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, salvation can be yours. Have you done that? Well, if not, friends, that is what God is calling you to right now. That is the message that God is giving you through his word today. Perhaps in your heart, like Felix, you're afraid. Perhaps you've heard the message of God's judgment and you know that you won't be deemed righteous. And you have a choice right now. Either you can ignore that fear in your heart and squash it down and go about living the way you always have. Or you can see that fear for what it really is. That fear is God tugging at your heart and telling you to turn to him in repentance. See, he is a good, good judge who has done everything for you to become right with him. All you need to do is confess your sin to him. Believe that through Jesus you will be forgiven. And then, like Paul, you can look forward to that judgment day because you know that he is a good judge who will declare you righteous. Not because of what you've done, but because he did it all for you. If you do that today, then please reach out to a Christian near you. Contact us at the church. The details will be in the video or on the, on the website. Get connected with people who can encourage you in your pursuit of righteousness and self-control. And most importantly, thank God that he is a righteous judge. And if you have already made that decision, if, like Paul, you can look forward to the judgment day and it feels like we're just in limbo right now, take heart from Paul. He wasn't afraid to talk about judgment. In fact, judgment was one of the things that was constantly on his mind and constantly on his lips. And maybe in this season, this is what God's calling us to be talking about as well. A reminder that maybe our lives are finite. And even though we spend most of our lives ignoring that fact, this is a chink in the armour. This is a reminder that maybe we don't have everything under control. Friends, maybe this is our opportunity to be telling people about righteousness, about self-control, and about the judgment to come. Let's pray right now to this good, good judge who's done everything for us. Lord, thank you once again for your word. Thank you that we can study it. Thank you that we can be encouraged by it. I pray for everybody who has listened to it today that you'll be calling them to a response. Whether that response is accepting your grace for the very first time, I pray that you will convict their hearts and help them to do that right now. For those of us who have already done that, for those of us who are your children, I pray that we can look forward to your judgment and that because we know we will stand before you and be declared righteous, we can be telling others about that. Please help us to be fearless like Paul was, to be able to share that with whoever comes across our path in this unique season that you've placed us in. Thank you that you have, have done all of this for a reason, for a purpose. And even if it feels like limbo, you do have a reason for every single day of it. Please help us to live in the light of that. In Jesus' mighty name.